I'd like to start this lecture with a quote from the Mercatus Center study of Hurricane Katrina, because I think it sets the tone for the ensuing discussion. Professor Emily Chomley Wright of Beloit College writes, quote, the fury of nature seemed to cause the institutions on which our society is based, those of government, commerce, and civil society, to crumble. The slow and seemingly inept responses of government at all levels, both in preparation for and recovery from the storm, infuriated Americans. The fury of nature and the fury of citizens at their government, an arresting juxtaposition of images, and it turns out an all too familiar one in recent decades. The frequency of dissatisfaction with government response to disasters raises two questions vital to the long-term well-being of our republic. First, is public fury justified? And then, perhaps more importantly, is railing at government the best approach to ensuring effective action in the next disaster? Keep these larger policy-oriented issues in the back of your mind as we use economic reasoning to take an objective look at what government can and cannot do when disaster strikes. To begin at the beginning, we have to start with the San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906. Before that time, with a few anomalous exceptions, disaster relief and response had not been considered a responsibility of government, and most especially not of the federal government. State and local governments largely confined themselves to rescue and then to reestablishing the rule of law. The general assumption was that government was responsible for order and security so that people could cope individually or communally with the problems the disaster had created for them. The first lines of support for victims were manned by families, churches, private charities, and voluntary communal aid organizations. That expectation began to change somewhat accidentally in 1906 when Congress ended up appro appropriating $2.5 million in disaster aid for the San Francisco earthquake. Now, compared to a FEMA response of today, $2.5 million may look like pocket change, a symbolic gesture at best, but we need to put it in perspective. That $2.5 million is equivalent to $300 million in 2006 per capita GDP, or more tellingly, $1 billion if the equivalent is relative share of GDP. So it was a big deal for the time, and it didn't happen automatically or offhandedly. Actually, the story is pretty interesting. Basically, the short form is that a zealous army general, temporarily in command of the Presidio, overstepped his authority. And in the end, the federal government made good on his unauthorized expenditures. General Frederick Funston ventured into the city immediately after the quake and was appalled by the devastation and suffering he witnessed. Returning to the Presidio, he ordered troops to begin rescue operations, set up a refugee camp, and sent out supply requisitions to West Coast military depots, all without consulting city officials or his military superiors, or waiting for the declaration of martial law that would have authorized federal intervention. Later, faced with a fait accompli, Secretary of War Howard Taft thought it best to sanction the action. But it's important from the 20th century perspective of automatically looking to FEMA to note that local and state governments weren't overjoyed at the federal response, and they moved quickly to reassert their realm of authority. In any case, the subsequent decision to allocate $2.5 million to disaster relief thus has the air of being a reimbursement for Funston's unauthorized expenditures on food, tents, blankets, and other relief supplies. But it can also be seen as the proverbial foot in the door for the federal government, albeit a reluctant foot at the time. President Theodore Roosevelt's immediate response to news of the quake and fire had been to telegraph California Governor George Pardee and San Francisco Mayor Schmitz to express concern and offer, quote, assistance, a typical and expected response at the time, as was the assistance that ensued. He sent Secretary of Commerce Victor Metcalf to the city to keep him informed of developments. At the same time, Roosevelt declined assistance and donations from foreign governments, saying that the United States had sufficient resources to take care of the problem, thank you very much, 
And when large city governments, notably Chicago, Boston, and New York, offered aid, he directed them to the Red Cross rather than to the notoriously corrupt San Francisco city government. And he gave the same response to philanthropic overtures from wealthy individuals like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. From that meager beginning, the role of the federal government in disasters has grown. In 1950, Congress gave the president the power to declare disaster areas, and the designation became the trigger for federal funding. In 1969, the Disaster Relief Act made federal aid available to individuals, where before that time, relief funding was limited to the repair and reconstruction of infrastructure and public buildings. In 1979, President Jimmy Carter created FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, and he did so by executive order. In, in 2008, FEMA's budget was $8.2 billion. Again, history has provided us with an economic laboratory of sorts. The disasters of the 20th and 21st centuries can be studied as real-world experiments, generating data to analyze and evaluate how effective the government is in the growing number of disaster relief roles it has taken on. Not surprisingly, we find that government acquits some disaster-related tasks admirably, and others, well, not so much, as my high school students would say. Lesson 3 considers both sides of the coin. First, we'll look at what government does well, in other words, what the institutional rules of the game are designed to do. And then in the second lecture, we'll use our tools of economic reasoning to analyze the, quote, slow and seemingly inept responses that infuriated Americans. To review, what does economics tell us about decision making? Well, first it asserts that people are rational decision makers, meaning they choose the alternatives that they believe to afford them the greatest excess of benefits over costs. Applying this rule to the public sector leads us to ask, for what activities do the benefits of government action in disasters outweigh the costs, and why? From our institutional perspective, what we're asking is, for what types of activities are the rules of the game that shape governmental institutions well suited? And when we talk about rules of the game, we're talking about incentives, which puts us on pretty solid ground to dispassionately look at what works and what doesn't. We can start by noting that there is general agreement among economists that two of the arenas in which the benefits of government action outweigh the costs are in maintaining and enforcing the rule of law, and in providing public goods, which, let me add a footnote, is not to say that economists always agree on what is or is not a public good. We'll look at each of these in turn, starting with the rule of law. Sometimes, in our haste to get to the details of specific economic decisions and outcomes, we tend to overlook the importance of the rule of law, or worse yet, as teachers, we dismiss it as a key topic in economics and relegate it to civics classes. This is unfortunate because ultimately, the effective functioning of our economic system rests on the stability of the rule of law. Clearly, the founders of our country recognized this. They deliberately established a government whose major purpose was to ensure the security and order necessary for citizens to prosper themselves. In studying the workings of the economy, we tend to take the rule of law for granted, and understandable as that is, it might behoove us to recognize from time to time the luxury it is that we can do so. Quoting again from the Mercatus study of Hurricane Katrina, which, by the way, we will use as our main illustration throughout Lesson 3, disasters certainly offer up a hard-to-ignore reminder of the importance of this fundamental institution. Governments help to clarify and enforce the rules of the game for our daily interactions with one another. When rules are clear and well enforced, the signals that emerge in markets and other social interactions tend to be ro robust and allow the interactions between members of society to be more fruitful and peaceful. Citizens of liberal democracies tend to take these rules of the game for granted, but they are vital to our daily interactions and overall well-being.
The robustness of markets and civil society depends crucially upon the social rules we tend to take for granted. Rules of private property, the rule of law, contract enforcement, and basic rights of self-determination. As crucial as these rules are for day-to-day -day interaction, they are all the more important to ensure in the wake of disaster. Having the police and National Guard on the streets as quickly as possible is beneficial since, unfortunately, looting seems to be a time-honored human response to large-scale misfortune, and assumption of the law and order task by government is not new. Our case study of the Chicago Fire in Lesson 2, for example, tells us that while they did little else, 19th century state and local governments took responsibility for reestablishing and maintaining the peace. When police and fire departments threatened to be overwhelmed by what the Chicago Evening Journal described as, quote, a horde of thieves, burglars, and cutthroats bent on plunder and who will not hesitate to burn, pillage, and even murder, authorities declared martial law, and Mayor Roswell Mason prevailed upon Civil War hero and Chicago resident Lieutenant General Philip Sheridan to lead in, ch in troops charged with preserving the good order and peace of the city. The immediate benefits of reestablishing order are obvious, and in the modern age, if we somehow manage to overlook them, television and news coverage are there to remind us. In the case of Hurricane Katrina, the lesson of the importance of the rule of law was taught not only in terms of the benefits of its presence, but also at the Superdome and other locations of the high cost of its absence. We should also pay attention not just to the immediate, but also to the long-term benefits of government's ability to reestablish and maintain civil order in the wake of disaster, and they are significant. First, the stable rule of law provides a foundation of expectation that empowers individual decision-making. Clearly, this is important in normal times, but that importance is magnified when people's alternatives are suddenly more limited or when all the alternatives seem to be undesirable. Choices are hard enough to make when your personal world has turned upside down without the added fear of civic disorder. Second, stability of expectation is vital to economic recovery. When the rules of the game are inconsistent or unpredictable, people and businesses delay decisions about starting rebuilding projects, resuming their normal economic pursuits, or even returning to the stricken area at all. If instability and uncertainty persist, businesses are more likely to relocate than to take the risk of rebuilding. As we saw in lesson two, markets can respond effectively to disaster conditions, but they will not respond if the rules of the game that allow them to succeed aren't in place. In Chicago in 1871, local government quickly imposed stricter building codes. True, the fire safety requirements increased the cost of rebuilding, but the point here is that the information about costs and benefits was quickly available through the market. Contrast this to the agonizingly slow recovery of New Orleans after Katrina, as governments have issued a succession of new and improved recovery plans, often with conflicting policies. The persistent atmosphere of uncertainty was a major factor in individual and business decisions to delay reconstruction or even to not return at all. And we'll talk more about this in the next lecture. Third, we have to think of the impact of the rule of law on other social institutions, and in turn, of the importance of those social institutions in providing incentives for players in the market. When civic order and a dependable rule of law are reestablished quickly after a disaster, schools and churches reopen, and their powerful forces in attracting disaster victims and their businesses back into stricken communities. And don't forget the nonprofits, another group that's reluctant to operate when civic order is shaky or absent. History also suggests the potential positive impact of governments sometimes changing the rules of the game after disasters. Now, a strong caveat here. When those changes facilitate adaptation to specific conditions created by the disaster and where there is a reasonable expectation that the changes are temporary accommodations that will speed up the return to normalcy. For example, California Governor George Pardee's quick thinking helped to avert financial panic in 1906 
as bankers and businesses realized that the fires set by the earthquake had burned up business and financial records. Keeping an eye on the pro process as businesses, customers, and banks reconnected and reconstructed their records, the governor declared each day from the quake on April 18th to June 3rd, 1906, to be a legal holiday. This meant that by law, banks could not open, and his temporary change in the rules effectively postponed payment dates, thus preventing financial chaos in Americans, one of America's major commercial centers. When the banks did reopen on June 3rd, it may not have been exactly business as usual, but it was sure close enough. In the last lecture, we looked at the gasoline market response to Hurricane Katrina and mentioned that rule changes help the market do what markets do best. The Gulf Coast oil refining industry took a double hit from Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. The shutdowns reduced refining capacity by as much as 5 million barrels per day. And yet, as we saw in the last lesson, there was no gas crisis. The market worked. But it turns out that the market worked partly because the rules of the game were changed to allow it to work. To borrow a phrase from Paul Harvey, let's look at the rest of the story. Here's how the rule change enabled the market. Most of us probably don't think too much about how our demand that government do things like ensuring safety or preventing air pollution impacts the day-to-day -day functioning of the gasoline market. At least, I confess that I never did. Oh, I'm sure that if we stopped to think about it, we'd all say, well, of course, there must be some controls on gasoline production and they must affect the price. But we're largely unaware of the specifics. I mean, did you know that there is such a thing as summer gasoline and winter gasoline? And even products that are called boutique fuels that are sold in very small markets, places with unique characteristics that have difficulty meeting clean air standards? Well, there are. And the federal government, in pursuit of environmental protection, regulates where and when these different gasoline products can be sold. When the Labor Day hurricanes hit, gasoline sales were still under the more stringent summer gas regulations. The refineries had been building up inventories of winter gas in anticipation of the coming season, but it wasn't legal to sell them yet. Recognize the Recognizing the potentially chaotic consequences of sticking strictly to the rules, the EPA took two important steps that freed the market to reallocate fuel. First, they authorized the early release of winter gasoline and gave waivers to localities with boutique fuel requirements. Second, they lifted restrictions on the high sulfur diesel fuel used by gasoline tanker trucks and the semis carrying relief supplies. And the market worked. Price changes pulled supplies into the places and uses most valued. Too bad that in all the accusations about government ineptitude, this story got so little attention. We need to be reminded that sometimes government is most helpful by stepping out of the way. By temporarily changing the rules, the EPA acknowledged, at least implicitly, the institutional advantage that markets had in quickly adapting to sudden shortage. The result? No fuel crisis. None, nada, zip. Okay, so to briefly recap, the question is, when disaster strikes, what can government do? First answer, it can maintain the rule of law and reestablish civic order to create a stable environment so our social and economic institutions can operate effectively. The second answer to the question of what government can do, by which we mean do well, of course, is that it can provide public goods, including such immediate activities as evacuation and search and rescue operations, and longer term projects like the rebuilding of roads and bridges. So let's move on to take a look at that function. First, we need to make sure that our, that our vocabulary is clear, because there's an unfortunate tendency to confuse public goods in the economic sense with publicly provided goods. True public goods are those that we value but which the market will not provide because they are non-rivalrous and non-exclusive. National defense is often held up as the classic public good. It is non-rivalrous in the sense that my or your consumption doesn't reduce the amount available to other citizens. 
My consumption of a hamburger, on the other hand, is rivalrous, as it definitely reduces, bite by bite, the amount available to you. National defense is also non-exclusive. That is, we can't yet, anyway, produce national defense and then exclude non-payers from its benefits. So together, non-rivalry and non-exclusivity combine to provide incentives for what's called free riding. If everyone else on your block pays for national defense, is there any cost to you of not paying, assuming all these payments are voluntary? And then think about your friendly neighborhood national defense store. What incentive does it have to sell national defense knowing that the non-payers can't be excluded from the benefits? Whoops, there goes the profit motive. The result is no private production of true public goods. So the argument goes, if we really value this product and private producers won't provide it, we turn to the government, which can eliminate free riders by compelling payment in the form of taxes. Now the confusion comes in thinking that all goods and services paid for by taxation and government spending, that is, publicly provided goods and services, are in fact true public goods. They're not. And as we'll see in the second lecture for this lesson, expecting government to provide things that are not true public goods may be setting ourselves up for huge disappointment. To clarify our vocabulary then, publicly provided goods and services are those paid for with tax revenue, but not all publicly provided goods and services are true public goods. That is, even though we choose to have the government provide them, trash collection is provided by local governments, for example, they are not subject to the free rider problem, and private producers could and would offer them for sale if allowed to do so. Since we've made a pretty good argument in Lesson 2 that the institutions of markets can effectively handle the provision of non-public goods, the question then becomes, what are the public goods for disaster mitigation? Now, I note here that there is no public goods for dummies list that we can go check, and economists disagree about what's on that list. And even if they did agree, technology is always changing. For a long time, lighthouses, for example, were presented as public goods. The argument was that you couldn't turn off the light for ships that hadn't paid. While there were a few examples of creative ways this difficulty was overcome in the past, modern technology has completely removed it. Innovations like transponders now make it possible to identify and charge everyone who uses the light, and so lighthouses are easily provided privately. Okay, so what about public goods in disasters? Well, first we'll argue that as a practical matter, search and rescue operations are a public good. Now, clearly you could imagine that it's possible for private businesses to sell this service. A person could subscribe paying an annual search and rescue fee, or search and rescue companies could invoice people that they rescued. In fact, companies routinely provide these kinds of services for physical property, towing wrecked cars into garages or disabled boats into port. But there's a pretty strong argument that this wouldn't work so well when we're talking about human lives and not just because of the free rider potential. Think about the owner of Rescues R Us, who gets a, a panicky call from a non-subscriber or from someone who doesn't have a credit card or a bank account. First, how many owners could really let the person die? And even for those hard-hearted enough to do so, what would be the legal ramifications, to say nothing of the public relations nightmare? The free rider problem would be huge, People would figure that natural disasters are pretty unlikely events, and that if they did fall victim, they are pretty likely to be rescued even if they didn't pay. Thus, it seems practical to consider search and rescue to be a public good to be paid for by taxes. And it turns out that, like restoring law and order, government is pretty good at emergency rescue. National Guard, state militias, and local police and fire departments acquit themselves well in general and even heroically in specific instances. So there's no problem adding emergency rescue as an answer to that question of what governments can do well in disasters. But what else? Here's a list of disaster-related goods and services. 
We've argued that emergency response is a public good, valued by the community, but unlikely to be provided by the market because the profit incentive is undermined by the free rider problem. Now, go through the rest of the list and determine whether the good or service is a true public good or is just something we've decided should be publicly provided. I'll give you a minute or so before I reveal the answers. Keep the criteria for public goods in mind by asking yourself whether the item is subject to the free rider problem. Here's what we came up with, and note that in some cases there are convincing arguments for both classifications. In fact, there's a great discussion to have with your students, especially if your community has recently been through a disaster. Also note that I simply asked you to identify the categories. How do we treat these goods and services, not how should we treat them? Not to worry though, we'll get to the should question and I'll leave you some tools to answer that after we complete the second lecture for this lesson. To summarize then, in this lecture, we've looked at what government can do in a disaster, the clear subtext being what can government do well. The criterion we established was the same as that for the other institution we examined, the market. Do the expected benefits outweigh the expected costs? We answered yes to two areas reestablishing the rule of law and maintaining order, and providing public goods, especially emergency search and rescue operations. In the second lecture for Lesson 3, we'll turn to the other side of the issue, asking, when disaster strikes, what does government not do so well, and why?